I guess the introduction of the idea of the intentional stance, which plays a role now throughout biology and in psychology and in computer science, and uh, even, I recently learned, uh, by some people in physics. And uh, the idea of uh, deliberately adopting the rational agent with the beliefs and desires as your framework, it puts a lot of, of issues in a tractable light. And so that, uh, I'm pretty happy with that. It's very hard to get people to abandon the idea of the inner theater, the Cartesian theater. People who listen to my arguments and say, oh yeah, I get it, yeah, that's right, no, there's no Cartesian theater, and then they go right back to asserting things which only make sense if there's a Cartesian theater. So it's a very pernicious illusion. When I first started out in the 60s, in the mid-60s, Philosophers in general were not paying attention to science, except for philosophers of science. And people in the philosophy of mind were not paying attention to neuroscience or psychology or artificial intelligence. And I just jumped in hard on that. Now, it's wonderful. There's several generations of philosophers of mind who have serious scientific training, which I never had. My education in the sciences was all uh, informal. After I'd begun doing my graduate work, I had a few very wise informants in psychology and neuroscience in Oxford. I'm not an autodidact <laughs> because I've been tutored by some of the world's best, and that's a, 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 just a great blessing. Well, I think the answer to that is yes, and it's, and it's Darwinian thinking. At the most basic level, once you get your head around good Darwinian thinking, you just abandon the idea of essence and necessary and sufficient condition. And you start thinking more in population terms, and you don't worry about what the difference maker is between X and Y, and what the essence of X and Y is. Essentialism is a bad idea. Uh, I, from somewhere, have said uh, nothing of any interest or complexity has an essence. Uh, and for a lot of philosophers, this really puts them out of work, because that's the only way they know how to do business. The idea that we don't need to know how something got the way it is in principle, that's right. But in practice, you will make terrible mistakes if you don't recognize that whatever it is you're puzzled by has a history that it got the way it is for reasons. And if you look at those reasons, you can find clues to what makes it work the way it does now. Early in the 21st century, I got quite worried about signs of impending theocracy in America. The religious right seemed altogether too powerful and uh, ominous. And so I decided I was going to have to weigh in in public on this and somehow. My friend Richard Dawkins and I both wrote editorials about a movement that was started in California. Neither one of us coined the term, the Brights Movement. What we both wrote editorials, he for The Guardian and me for The New York Times, and they went viral. Uh, it was the most shared story of the month in The New York Times for my piece. And people were beseeching me to take advantage of the spotlight and hold forth about religion. I didn't want to write a book about atheism, but I did. I was working on, on cultural evolution and memes, and I thought, well, let's see what we can do with a Darwinian account of the origin and development of religions. And that led to Breaking the Spell. When I was working on Breaking the Spell, I wanted to write a book that Maybe people were going to want to throw it across the room, 
But I wanted to remove all the superficial reasons for throwing it off the room. I didn't want to insult anybody gratuitously. So I went out of my way to find deeply religious people and talk to them to see what, how they responded to these issues. And one of the things I learned from these confidential interviews was that a lot of people who were known to their friends, famous in their community as being deeply religious, religion was the center of their lives, but they didn't believe a word of it. They just told me, no, that's not about creed. It's about community. It's about work and joining together in common cause. I thought, all right, I'm going to take them at their word. So in my book, there's almost nothing about arguments for or against the existence of God. I more or less take it for granted. No, God doesn't exist. And the religious people that I've talked to, they, that's not what they're in it for. So now we've got a, a secular perspective and a Darwinian perspective on this amazing phenomenon of religion, and how it evolves, and what's its future going to look like. And I think it's very important that we not be deluded about this as we go forward. And among the uh, effects of that now is that a, a very clever woman named Linda Lascola approached me at a conference and said, uh, well, you talk to people who were very involved in their churches, but they weren't pastors, they weren't clergy. But I'll bet there's atheist clergy out there too. And with the help of some other people, we located them, got a grant, and she interviewed them in deepest confidence. And that became the book caught in the pulpit about clergy that have lost their faith, but don't dare tell anybody until they spill their hearts out to Linda. That's had a modest success as a book, but it spawned something called the Clergy Project, where people in this circumstance can get together on a website. It's highly secure, and they're very carefully vetted. There are over 800 members, or maybe over 1,000 members now. Uh, these are people who either are currently pastors, clergy people, or former. I'm very proud of having had a hand in creating that. We are on the verge of mounting a production off-Broadway of a play based on Linda's interviews, and that's going to happen. First of all, it isn't that bad. I had been warned that it would be in particular with breaking the spell. People who thought they really knew said, Dan, you're going to have to have security, you're going to have to put in alarms on your house, you're going to have to wear a bulletproof vest, and you're going to be in danger. And I didn't know whether to take them seriously or not. They seemed to think they know. They didn't know. In fact, defenders who were offended by the books of the Four Horsemen uh, were paper tigers. Hitchens proved that perfectly by going wide open all through the Bible Belt, giving talks, never had any trouble. The conclusion, though, that I want to draw from this is that's what the atmosphere was in 2006. When that book came out, there were a lot of people who were really afraid of the radical right, the radical religious right, and what they might do. And of course, we still see some disgusting events, behavior by these zealots, but it's nowhere near the big problem that a lot of people thought it was. And I now view it as the desperate defensive struggles of people who realize that their whole worldview is going down the drain. Pure philosophy, philosophy done just as analytic metaphysics of mere conceptual analysis and where the only uh, inputs are the earlier philosophy. I think that's a, a, a sterile profession. Don't do it. Philosophy gains tremendously from the problems of other inquiries. And if you look at history, 
going back to Aristotle and Plato and the pre-Socratics, but also Hume and Locke and Berkeley, they were very keenly interested, as were, of course, Descartes, Descartes was himself a scientist, and Spinoza, Leibniz. The best philosophy has always been deeply nourished by other modes of inquiry, particularly science, but not just science. I think that's the one message that stands out for me.